Good afternoon, Gulf States. Uh, this is Rob DeLong with Data Connectors, and we are here for our second expert panel of the day today. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about ransomware prevention and some of the great pre-attack practices. Um, so much has been said about ransomware. Today, we get advice from everyone, government agencies, solution providers, industry pundits, we actually even now have ransomware as a service that has changed the way cyber leaders think about the topic and some of the economics related to it. You know, we're, we have sensitive data and it's being put at risk. Huge sums of money are in the balance. Organizations struggle with what is the right decision. Uh, we put together a great panel today of experts, and I'd like to take a second right now and introduce them. First, we have Michael Gorlick and he is the CTO of Morphosec. Michael, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Hi, Rob. Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, I'm Michael Gorelick. I'm the Chief Technology Officer uh, of Morphosec uh, with more than 15 years of experience in cybersecurity, but really even more experience in uh, programming. I have about seven patents in the IT security landscape and leading Morphosec, which is a breach prevention company uh, with a technology based on moving target defense with a goal to create the attack surface as unpredictable. Awesome. And we'll probably talk about it in details more. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, we also have Jay Paz. He's the Senior Director of Delivery at Cobalt. Uh, Jay, tell us about yourself. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I'm Jay. Uh, I've been in IT for the last 20 years uh, and in penetration testing or offensive security for the last 13. Um, I grew up a developer. Uh, and grew into a uh, breaker uh, and ethical hacker. Awesome. Thanks, Jay. Um, we also have Chris Haas. He's the Director of Information Security and Research at Automax. Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Haas, Director of Information Security and Research here at Automax. Um, been in the threat intel and the threat research space pretty much my entire career for the last 10, 15 years. Um, did a lot of uh, principal research for logarithm, um, for silence, um, spent some time at, at DOD at the NSA for a little while. Um, so a vast majority of my background is around tracking ATPs, um, doing threat research and malware reverse engineering. Got it. Thank you, Chris. And then last but surely not least, we have Mackenzie Jackson. He's the head of DevRel and the security advocate for GitGuardian. Mackenzie, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, no, thanks for that. So yeah, Mackenzie, uh, before Working for GitGuardian, I was a CTO of our health tech company called Compago, based in Australia. Um, and uh, you have a huge passion for building robust systems and building secure systems. Uh, so get to work with a lot of research teams on Threat Intel and kind of get to do fun stuff like this. So, yeah, that's me. Awesome. Thank you, Mackenzie. So, you know, this, this group is going to be giving us some great ideas and some thoughts on ransomware. I know one of the big things that the audience probably is thinking is, is ransomware going to go away anytime soon? Chris, I think you have some thoughts on that. You want to share them with us? Yeah, I mean, I think it really just depends on how profitable, you know, that that type of attack is is to their attackers, right? Um, the, the easier it is for them to get more money, to be able to have some money transfers. And it's lucrative for ransomware attackers and developers to continue to um, go about producing more attacks. It's always going to be something that we're going to have to deal with um, going forward. So I think it's pretty much uh, a vast majority of attack is always um, going to uh, last as long as it's profitable for the attackers, right? And I think that's some of the reasons why we see ransomware as a service gains kicking up, or they've been around for a while, actually, for uh, quite some time and continuing to go strong. A lot of them have, you know, developed teams of you know 10 to 20 even to 100 developers working um, together for ransomware as a service providers things like that it's a pretty big business um, so as long as it's profitable as long as it's easy to get paid and as long as um, folks that are, are are involved in a, a ransomware attack continue to pay ransoms then you know we're going to continue to have to deal with it uh, going forward you know back in the day it was significantly more difficult to pay for ransomware with gift cards or things like that. Now that we have easeful, it's easier to transfer money through, um, you know, blockchain like like Bitcoin and a few other uh, ways to exchange uh, monetary uh, values. It's it's going to be around for a while. Yeah, I mean, it's been here since the late '80s, early '90s, right? Uh, and Absolutely. It's here, uh, it's just that we're more aware of it now. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would say it's trending in. It's going to be here a while. 
Yeah, yeah and we're definitely seeing the the, the rise of, of of these these gangs, these protectors act, operate and act like businesses. They have overheads, they have targets um, that they need to meet, and you know we need to start uh, uh, treating them as businesses and not just kind of rogue rogue individuals or rogue actors, and uh, give them the kind of the give give them the benefit of the doubt that they kind of deserve to be able to counter them. Yeah, absolutely. It's almost, you know, I know we've talked a lot about it. It's not a if it's going to happen anymore. It's probably it's a when it's going to happen. And what are some things that we can do to, to make sure we're set up securely? I know ultimately we, we in 2020, in March of 2020, we sent a bunch of people home. And, you know, before it was probably a little bit easier to keep our, our, our guard up and, and to, to have things in place to make sure that we were secure. But I know now that people are home, it's become even more difficult to monitor and enforce good security policies. Uh, Mackenzie, I think you have some thoughts on that. You want to share those with us? Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, with everything going more remote um, now, you know, we've increased our attack services. It's, it's harder to segment, um, you know, and, and kind of protect areas from from that. And we've also seen that we need to widely distribute. Uh, sensitive elements like credentials to, to large members of the teams. It's not so much, it's not a new problem with remote work, but it's become more complicated uh, because we have to take it outside of these closed uh, these closed networks off the time. And this is kind of giving uh, attackers the opportunity to move laterally, elevate their privileges and really access to sensitive information, uh, which is going to kind of trigger someone to, to, pay, to pay their ransom. You know, so we just we've, we've basically just moved outside of this nice secure bubble and made it difficult, not impossible, because we can, you know, we can implement and secure these these areas. We can implement white sourcing and other elements of zero trust, um, but it, it 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 does certainly become a whole lot more diff difficult when we don't have eyes on the machines, when we're using personal networks, we're using personal machines, and we don't have ultimately strict control over what our employees do at home. Right? It's hard to enforce the practices, you know, of your own home, you have to have this type of, you know, rapid, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. I, I would add, I, I would add uh, that on top of, you know, obviously managing the security, you see uh, a lot of cases in which the data itself is distributed. So basically the PI, you know, uh, private information, you, you have physicians that are using remote uh, devices. So uh, it's not only the managing, it's also uh, the fact that your data is everywhere you cannot manage, uh, you cannot see the, all the concept of shadow IT becomes irrelevant and et cetera. So definitely a higher risk, significantly higher risk. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and with these risks, um, you know, and try to minimizing these risks, a lot of us have kind of went to doing different, different pen tests and, and kind of figuring that whole world out. Um, Jay, I know you've given some information in the past about how often you should pen test and what areas of your environment you should focus on. Can you give us a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, definitely. First off, you know, pen testing should be a, a part of your overall vulnerability management program. Uh, you know, it, there is no silver bullet. Uh, you, you need to make sure that it's robust and that your program uh, can be flexible and expand and contract as needed. Uh, it's really important. Secondly, uh, it's also highly important uh, to really uh, know your data uh, and and uh, really kind of classify what that data is and what risk it has to your organization and how you're managing it and how you're uh, distributing it. Uh, that's also really important and that can help you really put together a program that helps decide how often I need to pen test and what do I need to pen test. The systems that have access to the most um, risky data in your environment, that's obviously an area that you need to focus more on. Um, also, you know, focus on changes. If your organization already has a great change management program, uh, then incorporate the verification of those changes within that program uh, and make sure that there is validation of vulnerabilities or potential exploits in your environment at the same cadence that you're doing change management, right? If you're an agile organization, you're probably doing that every couple of weeks. Uh, and so you probably should be testing just like you're doing quality assurance testing or beta testing for those new features, uh, you should really look at the vulnerabilities that may have been exposed during the development of that new feature or new area of the network that you just opened up or new segment. Um, and also, finally, I would say that uh, test your assumptions, right? We, we deploy a lot of tools, we deploy a lot of new processes to try and, and secure our environment. 
but we do so with the human element that is uh, assumptions, right? We assume this is going to work. Our vendor told us it was going to work. Well, make sure that you're testing those assumptions. And whenever you do deploy something new, you're going back in and double checking that it's actually valid. Yeah, yeah, no, that's all good advice. And I know we as, as security specialists are, are constantly putting up all kinds of different barriers and doing different things. But unfortunately, we still have a lot of attackers that are bypassing our current defenses. Uh, Michael, can you tell us a little bit about how some of the different tactics some of these attackers are using? Yeah, I mean, um, there are obviously a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, as we see it uh, as part of the company, um, attack events, forensic and, uh, you know, an analysis, we identify a lot of living off the land, fileless kind of attacks, um, white listing bypass, attacks that uh, their goal to evade security solutions today. So uh, attacks that bypass CDRs, AV solutions, uh, and more. Um, the thing is that many of those attacks successful in runtime uh, because of inherent weaknesses of uh, security solutions. All security solutions are important, EDRs are important, signature validation is also important, but it has to be complemented with a good preventive technology, uh, especially on the runtime. So if you see uh, an attacker that tries to execute um, a position dependent or uh, malicious code within the runtime, it has the advantages of when, where, and what, while the vendor need to scan all the time um, for uh, for to identify this malicious malicious code. So runtime is a big, big issue for security vendors. We fight with it uh, in a different way. We introduce polymorphic, uh, unpredictable attack surface. We, we modify and change how uh, the runtime looks like. So the attack, uh, attacker basically fails by definition without trying to understand how it works. Um, and there are other preventive technologies as well, uh, which should be uh, implemented uh, in those places. Okay. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And one of the biggest prevention tools is, is just making sure that you're prepared. Um, I know a lot of organizations put a lot of different things together so that they can be prepared for a, a ransomware campaign. Chris, you have some deep more detail on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think one, you always have to have a prevention first uh, kind of mindset when you're um, setting up any type of security um, organization within a, within a company. Um, you, you definitely want to make sure that you're doing you're doing patching the best you can, making sure that you're just doing the basics of security correctly, like you know having safe passwords and forcing MFA, um, doing loose privilege as much as you possibly can. All those things are really important. Um, but one of the other things that typically gets overlooked is just coming in with a solid IR plan, right? I think what happens a lot is um, an attack actually happens. Um, even though you you think that you're planning for it, but when it comes down, um, when your team is stressed and things like that, um, just trying to figure out who's going to send out communications to your customers, figuring out which um, person within your organization has that customer list, the affected customer list. How are we going to convey that um, incident to our customer base? Um, is it going to and does that different type of response or communication uh, depend on the severity of the incident? Right. There's a lot of things that can happen. Um, especially during an incident, which makes it incredibly important for you to practice your IR plan. So one of the things that we do is we do a full-on, you know, tabletop that in includes it's it's three days long, where you know the first two days is uh, technical assessment where we conduct malicious attacks on ourselves to see if we can prevent those, and if we can, great. If not, then we move on to the next stage where we work through with the executive leadership and all members within the business to send out comms and how we're going to work through that incident things like that. So you need to make sure that not just that you have the right solutions in place, um, as Michael talked about, sometimes those solutions do not work 100%. There's no silver bullet. So you need to make sure that you're prepared and ready for that event so you can reduce as much um, blast radius as possible. Because um, you want to make sure that, you know, when you sustain attack, that you're conveying to your customer base that you were ready for said attack and you did everything you possibly can, not just to prevent it, but also to reduce risk um, uh, as it was occurring. Okay, that's great. I, I mean, it, it's not the if, right? It's the when, and you should be prepared mm -hmm. for the when uh, in, in, in any yeah. sport and in any other area in life, right? Like we practice, 
uh, we get out there and, and we figure out what we need to do, where our gaps are, who can play that uh, position, who can't, uh, who's a better hitter. Uh, I think you need to do that from a business perspective as well, right? Like practice all of the things that you are preparing your, your teams to actually execute. Because if you don't mm -hmm. practice them, you're going to fumble uh, it, when it really does happen. Uh, and it's so hard to recover when that incident is happening uh, in that moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Anxiety is high, stress is high. And if you haven't uh, built in muscle memory, uh, then you're not going to know how to act in that moment. Yeah, on, a continuous, on a continuous manner, right? Uh, many, many businesses do it once and say, hey, I'm good. Yeah, uh, but it, change is introduced, as you said, Jay, all the time. You know, you're deploying new instances, you're deploying new servers, new vulnerabilities, new attack surface. Um, you have to do it in a continuous way. Yeah. And make yeah. it fun too, right? Like, don't, don't be too <laughs> serious about it. Like, it's a tabletop exercise. Like, we're exercising our mind, our ability, our people, our processes, our technology. Uh, and so have fun with it, right? Like, help them know uh, that this is important for them to actually have a clue. Uh, and knowledge is power, right? Like for your organization in general uh, and sharing that knowledge and, and really training your teams. And and I'm not just talking about like security awareness training in October, right? Like I'm talking about like really talking to your teams about why it's important, what the risk is and being transparent with it, right? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I know too, you know, I'm glad you were talking, Jay. Um, I got another question for you. One, one of the big questions that people have is, is, is ransomware protection different from other protection for other threats? Do they overlap? I mean, you've heard us talk about all of the same tools and same approaches and, and you know, that we do for any other kind of vulnerability, any other kind of uh, risk to your environment, your people. Uh, and so, yes, there are nuances. But by and large, if you have a good vulnerability management program, if you're doing the, the low hanging fruit stuff well, uh, then you're gonna be pretty well protected, right? Uh, your environment is different. It's different than mine. It's different than Mackenzie's and Chris's and Michael's, right? So there's gonna be differences. Uh, and the level of knowledge and experience that your teams have also varies and has a huge impact on how you approach it. But by and large, we're talking about the same kind of defenses for many types of vulnerabilities and exploits that exist. No, that, that's good. It's we're, we must be doing a good job. I got a comment from the audience here. It says it's great to hear you focus on more than just the technology in your tabletops and full scale exercises. My focus is BC and you guys are speaking my language. So panelists, thank you. You're doing a good job. You know, I actually, I actually heard about this this morning. Um, I was catching my news before I headed out the door and, and they brought up the title or the thought of cryptocurrency. That plays a huge role in ransomware. Chris, you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it plays a whole a huge role in culture in general, right? It's a transformative technology. So, you know, I, I don't believe that cryptocurrency is going away anytime soon. I think if anything, it's gaining traction, going to be here forever. Um, and as long as there's a median such as that, that allows for easy transference of wealth because of a ransomware attack, I think we'll just continue to see, you know, growth and ransomware attacks, right? Until we find a way uh, to be able to make that not as lucrative through those ransomware as a service providers, right? There's, it's always going to be there. Um, I don't think there's really anything that's going to go away. Yeah, yeah. I know I'm going to switch, switch, switch lanes here a little bit. Um, so one of the things I know that has started to come into the industry is, is talk about MTDs and, and how is it proven to be a, an effective defense against ransomware? Michael, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, Robert. Uh, and thank you for, for the question. So MTD is moving target defense. As I mentioned before, it's basically creating the attack surface. Attack surface is, can be your perimeter, but it can be also your applications. It can be anything that can be exploited or leveraged for exploitation, lever, uh, lateral movement, registration, whatever. Uh, if you can make it unpredictable, uh, that uh, in order so that the attacker will basically uh, try to understand and will fail, we know that attackers are becoming more polymorphic. They're becoming, uh, they're changing their stuff all the time. Why not applying this technology on the target system? Instead of understanding how the attack works, let's change the concept of the uh target and this way uh, the attack fails it has to come together with deception 
basic kind of uh, living uh, breadcrumbs, uh, canaries, uh, in order to lure the attackers into the uh, place he, he is aware of. Again, we are solving a very specific uh, problem with advanced threats, but as you mentioned before, it has to be a, a stack of I mean, both solutions, both training, uh, both awareness, uh, EDR and AVs are in place and very important there, uh, but advanced preventive technologies should be there as well. Uh, and this is our role. We are uh, doing a great job. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. We actually, we, we have a, a question here in the queue um, and I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna start it with Mackenzie and then I may, may let some of the rest of you answer it. But, you know, ransomware seems to be evolving and it, it's no longer just about encrypting files. Um, some of the most recent breaches have came out and it, it's all about revealing some data about the company publicly. Um, Mackenzie, how does this change your prevention strategy? Yeah, I mean, it, it changes it changes everything quite a lot. And, you know, like we've recently seen this sort of lapses, um, you know, the, the, the group, they went on a rampage publishing source code uh, publicly, Samsung, NVIDIA, Microsoft, uh, lots of lots of different different companies and this change is kind of part of the prevention right because now it's kind of now no one can have the argument oh but my, my data is backed up and secure if they encrypt it i i can you know i could un restore backup and we lose a few hours well now they're targeting sensitive information doesn't matter um if they encrypt it or not anymore because that information could be going public you know and for example we're looking into the the samsung breach um thought that many people talked about this, but there was thousands of secrets in that source code, private keys. Uh, we know that from NVIDIA, there, there, there was some signing certificates that were used to sign malware um, that was in that source code. So this is significant in information. It changes the game because now uh, we can't just rely on backups. We have to make sure, okay, we're protecting this data um, as best we can, but where possible in places like our source code, uh, like our backups, like our wikis, we don't have sensitive information attackers can leverage to hurt us. You know, we don't have secrets in there. Um, our source code is written in a way that if if it if it's made public, um, you know, it's not it's not the not the end of the world uh, and these types of areas. We need to change our thinking a bit because the attackers have the attackers have changed their thinking uh, regularly. So we need to keep up with that. Yeah, a hundred percent. I, you know, it goes back to having a secure software development lifecycle, right? And uh, and also coming in and having a third party assess your assumptions, right? Uh, I'm sure those developers thought there's no way they're going to get into our repositories, right? Like we've got multiple factor authentication. I need a certificate to be able to authenticate, to pull or to push requests, etc. Mm -hmm. And yet they were uh, able to get to those secrets, right? And so again, it's those assumptions sometimes that, that really bite us in the behind, right? And, and, and really thinking about the data again, I'm sure that in their data classification, they didn't think about maybe their source code or where they were storing their certificates, et cetera, right? They were thinking about their business data, their customer data, but data is data and the value is mm -hmm. there, right? Uh, and so we need to think about data differently. Uh, and how we're securing that data uh, it has a lot to do with the type of data that it is and who has access to it. Yeah, and it's, it's a, it's a multifaceted uh, problem too, right? There's not one vendor that's going to solve your issues. You have to implement lots of different solutions um, to be able to solve this from different 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 areas. And I think that's always a challenge with, with attackers is that we need to implement multiple layers of security uh, along the way in different areas, not just uh, in, in in standard ways, we have to start broadening what we're thinking about, what we're protecting, and uh, really kind of using attack stories to try and figure out what is it that I have, you know, what would I pay money for if someone stole, <laughs> you know, because like, yeah. that, that's, yeah. that's what the attackers are trying to figure out too. That's huge. Uh, I also think that there's one component that we haven't talked about, uh, and that's a, a, a concept of shame, right, for our defenders, for our internal teams, for those that are working on securing your environment. Uh, work to remove that uh, that shame, right? Like incidents happen. This is why we have all these tools, why we have incident response uh, approaches, why we test, why we do what we do as security professionals, right? Uh, and reminding them that uh, our, the malicious attackers have unlimited funds and unlimited time, right? They, they are working every single day to try and get you. Uh, and it's hard to defend against that. 
Uh, and so if we have an environment that makes our defenders feel like they failed when something happens, and that's hard to recover from and hard to get them to re-engage to actually do the things they have to do when the incident is afoot, right? Uh, and so making sure that we're also taking care of our people is super important, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I think we're kind of coming to a close here. I'd like to take a, a few minutes here at the end to to let the guys kind of give you a little bit about, you know, essentially what you would be going to them. You know, what are, what are them and their companies solve for? I will tell you this, though. You know, one of the great things about this community is that these these gentlemen and some of the others that I've been with, they, they just really take a lot of pride in just being a good resource. Um, whether or not maybe they can solve for the problem, they're still willing to give you advice, help you, um, because we're all in this together. We're all trying to solve this crazy world. Um, and it, it is, it's going to take all of us. So, um, Michael, tell us a little bit about why someone should come and talk to you and, and, and your company. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so basically I mentioned our technology and our military defense, but I have to, to go there again, as we all, uh, uh, mentioned about the, the stack of solutions and um, uh, as, as you know the warning uh, by Biden for the cybersecurity uh, landscape change um, and the nice recommendation that were provided by uh, by the administration uh, are following this uh, this change you, you notice that the, the rebel attack appeared again reappeared so sophistication goes up uh, criminals are allowed to attack and uh, we have to apply some basic things uh, for our protection and there was a couple of recommendations you know that uh, were delivered a mandate uh, multi-factor authentication deploy modern security tools uh, check with your, uh, with your cyber professionals for vulnerability management back off site etc there are like nine ten recommendations if you go and implement those recommendations your attack surface will be hard enough or harder than others for the attackers to exploit. So attackers will choose always the easier target. Um, and one of those recommendations, really those deploying those advanced tools such as uh, preventive technology, such as Morphosec. And we are here for you to, to help you with this test. Awesome, thank you, Michael. Jay, what about you? We are a pen test as a service company. Uh, we test your people, process, and technology through the attacker's mindset, uh, whether it's internal, external applications, mobile devices, mobile applications, IoT devices, IoT uh, ecosystem. Uh, we really do try and help uh, to find the areas where you may not have paid enough attention uh, and then also help you remedi remediate it. Um, and so come to us if you want to test those assumptions uh, and your people, phishing, social engineering, uh, really anything that a malicious attacker could think of doing, uh, we can work with your team to help you figure it out. Gotcha. Chris? Sure. Yeah, you can come talk to us about Automox. We are a cloud native uh, patch management um, cyber hygiene platform. So when we talk about doing the basics with the Shield Up initiative, as Michael was talking about, um, Automox can really help you um, reduce the time it takes for you to, to patch your vulnerabilities, to apply secure configuration, um, and just having visibility um, from a cloud native solution to be able to patch those things without being on a VPN or all consolidated into your uh, singular network. So really help kind of um, secure our, our remote workforce. Great, Mackenzie. Yeah, so we're from uh, from Guardian. So what we're focused on is identifying uh, sensitive information inside source code uh, and inside uh, your internal systems, uh, kind of giving you visibility over where secrets uh, like API keys, credentials, uh, ha like have sprawled to. And not only can attackers use this to, 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 to ransom this information because it's sensitive if they find it, uh, but also they can use it to move laterally into different systems, um, you know, to further target other information. So really important that uh, we make sure we have visibility of where these assets are. And so Good Guardian can help you do that. And we also provide a lot of research uh, into the subject. So we have some reports, uh, the state of secrets role that, uh, that you can look at just to get more information. Well, again, gentlemen, thank you so much. It's been another wonderful panel. Um, for all those of you out there in virtual world, make sure that you go and visit these guys at their virtual booths. Um, lots of great information and intel for you and your businesses that you represent. So thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the conference.